Hi, my name is Hannah, and today we will interview Margaret. Originally from Trinidad, she is now based in the UK, and is a lawyer qualified to practice in the English-speaking Caribbean since 1995. Currently, Margaret is doing doctoral research at the University of Bath, exploring complexity theory, public health procurement, and public policy implementation. She calls herself a legal futurist. Today, she gives us his view on key trends as we emerge into a post-pandemic world. This podcast channel is about you, successful international entrepreneurs. Successful expats, successful investors, sponsored by HCJ Contacts. Hey, good afternoon, Margaret. How are you today? Oh, hi, hi. I'm <laughs> great, Darren. Um, I'm so glad that we finally got it together, our time and our schedules to have this conversation we've been needing to have. Yeah. And, and thanks and, for inviting me. So fantastic, and thanks for sharing your time. I know you're a very busy person. And for those who are watching or for those who are listening, could you introduce yourself, please? Introduce myself. Yeah, I'm Margaret Rose Goddard, originally from Trinidad and Tobago. Been qualified to practice law for the last 25 years or so, specializing primarily in public law and public procurement law, anti-corruption and those kinds of issues. I now live in the UK. Um, have been doing so for the better part of a decade, um, completing my doctorate in uh, public policy implementation and complexity science, very sexy area that wow. I like. And um, I've recently uh, founded the Future Law Institute, um, where we are building a collaborative of lawyers, domain experts, and system thinkers all around the world um, who are trying to identify the gaps, you know, at, you know, that we can then create narratives around and uh, uh, legal reform solutions around. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's the work that I'm currently involved in. Wow, your hands must definitely be full. So, but that also gives you a, a unique vantage point. We are going through what we're going through. And there are many ways of looking at it. What yeah. do you think are the key trends that one should pay attention to going forward? key trends that one should pay attention to going forward. I mean, I think we should recognize the patterns um, that we are seeing emerging in almost every country worldwide. I think the first thing, so I think for COVID-19, I'm not sure I would use the word trends. Mm -hmm. I would say, what are the patterns that, that we are seeing um, that, that are applying across many jurisdictions yeah. for then us to then analyze that to identify well you know what is you know a trend but I, I but, but the first thing I would say is one of the patterns we saw coming across almost every single jurisdiction is uh, the poor and vulnerable communities in society which would include migrants um, as well and refugees mm -hmm. are the most dis proportionately impacted when it comes to COVID. And so it, 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 what, it, what, what the patterns that, that we see coming out is that the, the, the way we've organized ourselves um, across the board in, in, in most jurisdictions, um, we, we, we have not created effective nets um, uh, to, to address what is going on with the poor and the, marginalized and vulnerable communities so i think that's the the biggest thing that we see um coming out when you're looking at it from a people's perspective um a second issue that i think we have to 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 look at which is out of the patterns coming out has to do with uh how are governments using the new powers that they have aggregated onto themselves because of this global pandemic how are they using those powers in respect to the rights of human beings, of citizens? And we see that, uh, you know, there is there's clearly an attempt to deal with our data 
in ways that we need to have a little more oversight on. Uh, yes, we we understand that we need to understand and track where people who have COVID are. Um, and so it, it, we must balance the, the, the tension between protecting um, public interests and uh, in health and the private right you know, that we have to the privacy of our information. And I think there's a lot there that we have to look into because if we are not vigilant, then uh, governments will be accumulating and acquiring a lot of data in this time. And that data, we don't know how that in data is going to be used and or commoditized in the future. So, um, so first, poor and vulnerable communities. Uh, second, data, you know, what's happening with our data and and, and that there, there's a real big issue uh, even greater issue emerging around that because uh, also building off of yes governments are getting more data is also the fact that because of lockdown we are all online and so therefore we are all now generating so much more data online um, that certain uh, organizations certain corporations have access to zoom has access to the conversation you know what we're doing right now there's google there's facebook there's twitter there's all of all of these um uh, you know what i would call supra national um entities that are capturing our data that have tools to analyze our data and therefore understand ourselves better than we do because you know when you're analyzing aggregate data over time at these micro points the amount of insight that you can get which can then if gone into the wrong hands can be manipulated we're seeing that how it impacts democracy um and elections which is going to be a live issue in, and is a live issue right now in the us and in other countries around the world so that i think you know data and how we treat with data is an, a huge emerging issue that 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 would have to be addressed and and, and so yeah, I would I would want to stop there on two the, these two main areas yeah. um, that I see emerging. That yeah. Okay, so my thesis has been uh, I'm trying to keep an open mind here, but my thesis has been that this situation, this pandemic, hasn't created anything new. What it has done is acted as a catalyst, and it has exacerbated, accelerated certain pre-existing patterns or trends. Right, and in terms of income inequality, uh, we had the brilliant work from Thomas Piketty, and he's written a series of books, actually demonstrating beyond a shadow of a doubt that income inequality in the Western world, because the data is more readily available, so Europe, North America, has been uh, heading in the wrong direction since 1980s, and then in yeah. terms of the information warfare, we have, we've had WikiLeaks, we've had Edward Snowden. So we knew yeah. it was an infringement. It was an area of concern, uh, you know, for, for the yeah. past of many other years. So in that sense, it has accelerated it. It has exacerbated it. It has whatever. But anything else? Or is there any other angle? Or is you think that these things are of such grave concern that it, it's, that's where the focus should be right now? No, well, okay. Yes and no, but I agree with you 100%. I believe COVID has not catalyzed anything new except a new uh, opportunity to understand the world that we live in, right? Um, I think COVID was like the straw that broke the camel's back. And we've been building to this. And, you know, if you want to, it's like Trump, you know, is Trump the reason for what went wrong in U.S. handling of COVID and what's going on with the trade? Was is Trump really the reason or uh, underlying is Trump a sy symptom of what was going on before? So, yeah, 100% agree with you on that. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I am in back-to-back -back meetings every day right now, talking to lawyers who are working with issues on the ground. And so, I mean, as I came into this conversation, I came in with those couple issues that are really, really pressing on the communities that we are serving right now. But I mean, there are other issues. Um, so of course, the issue of ecology, you, you saw within a few weeks of lockdown, uh, you know, in April and stuff in, around the world, you saw all of the indicators that we were, it was the biggest issue facing the world prior to COVID, environment, 
we saw that within weeks, some of those indicators were just going, dropping drastically. We saw our, our lakes and rivers looking clean and clear. And, you know, and we, we saw the vibrancy, the clarity of the... And, and so um, on, on the issue of ecology, I, I think the trend is going to be that we recognize that human action uh, can create a powerful impact because there was a lot of throwback or, or refutation of that um, uh, before COVID. Before COVID, it was like, well, this is inevitable. We are, we are developed in this way. Um, and we, we're thinking it's the Anthropocene, but it's, you know, and the, the, everything will be fine. But really and truly, we recognize it is the Anthropocene that is impacting the environment in a particular way right now. And so um, let us, uh, we now see that our actions can have a direct impact. So I think a trend that if you want to pull out a trend from what we're seeing is that I think companies and organizations are going to be thinking about how can we uh, organize ourselves and operate and uh, create and capture value in ways that are not so harmful to the environment and also in new ways that rely more on digital tools and technology. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, there is that positive uh, sort of opportunity arising there, but there are positive opportunities arising with the data and with how uh, the poor are treated as well. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, but, okay, so let's go back to, to your role as you know someone who wants to and and correct me if i'm wrong if i summarize everything that you have done and are currently doing it's about uh creating meaningful change so uh, is that a fair summary uh, am i yeah, i guess i guess we all are i guess uh, everybody's about creating meaningful change not so i think so in our own lives or in our families and communities and and all of that i, I think um my work is really around identifying uh, uh, areas in the law that are contributing to our current uh, socio-ecological realities um, and uh, seeing to what extent uh, they need to be amended, augmented, reformed, um, and or, uh, yeah, pushed, uh, you know, in other jurisdictions. So, ex for example, we are looking at in the issue of ecology, we're looking at, you know, what New Zealand did with their zero carbon legislation. What if every country could pass legislation like that? So part of what, you know, so that, that's the work that, that we are involved in right now at Future Law and our collaborative has grown to over 180 lawyers and domain experts and system thinkers from all over the world. We're in every continent and we are represented in 51 countries right now. So um, pretty incredible work going on. And we are hoping to present a lot of what we're doing um, at a summit later this year in October. Okay, that's fantastic. So one of uh, my concerns and perhaps other people's as well is, is to some extent overreach. So you did mention it that in dealing with what is obviously a crisis, governments have had to, you know, gather more power than they did previously. And I guess history kind of tells us that when a government uh, acquires more power, they're more reluctant to give it up once the yeah. crisis has passed. Yes. That is, do you agree with that? And if so, where do you see that heading? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And this is the reason why we have to be uh, hypervigilant at this time because we have to see the policies that are being put in place for the collecting of our data, for the treatment of citizens, for the rights of citizens. What are the sunset clauses that are being put in place? Because you are talking about like, what is gonna be the new normal? And I think that is the crucial question um, that we have to be asking. So I think these series of conversations you're having are so important. Um, and the theme for our uh, the summit in October, interestingly, is negotiating Mm -hmm. the new normal mm -hmm. that's the theme mm -hmm. so uh, because we recognize that that there are these uh, powers that uh, governments are taking on to themselves and and we have and we, there's a new reality that we are all living in we recognize the threat of covid and it's not just covid because from the scientists they're saying that um this is just the first of many different strains that could come so we really need to find new ways of being and doing with each other yeah um so it is a new normal 
uh, and the question is how do we negotiate this new normal with the governments and i think a significant um thing that needs to happen is we need to have more interdisciplinary multidisciplinary conversations like what we are having right now you with your tax expertise and all of that and, and me with some of the legal expertise and, and and scientists and all of that we need to have these kinds of conversations so that we can drive empirically responsible policy change mm -hmm. not just panic policy change mm -hmm. right so what you're seeing for example in the area of international trade is really um interesting so you, you would understand this area where you know we had developed into such a hyper globalized i mean i'll say hyper because that sounds like if i have a political agenda but we've developed in such a globalized environment that companies you know routinely their supply chains are really long and vast and, and all of the place covid has kind of you know initially placed a sort of a hold on that so for example around april it was said that there was almost an international halt on trade in ppe and medical goods and that sort of thing countries just retreated countries that were producing were saying well nothing is going out export curbs and restrictions were put on um and countries started trying to make it in their own you know so we saw a retreat from free trade and globalization to people trying to look to see how can we become more locally resilient and that sort of thing and the question when you talk about trends and, and what's coming after is going to be ah is that going to be a long-term retreat uh from these kinds of globalized supply chains and is there going to be a massive shift towards local resilience and um yeah that, that's a that's going to be a big question coming up and going forward uh, we are looking at that issue that's one of the issues we're looking at um in particular um I, I think one of the things we are seeing is that yes there is going to be a movement in global supply chains and i think um, countries are going to look to build their uh, capacity right locally to be ready for future pandemics and or any other crisis um, that of transnational nature that we may face yes that will happen to a certain extent um, however i do think that um, you will you will also see if certain things are put in place uh, you know the uptick in in trade again we also see with trade and services though a massive um growth onto digital the digital space and yeah. that sort of thing and so and that certainly in the new normal yeah. can't see that changing we can't see that changing that's just going to grow our yeah our trade and services digitally that's that's an interesting point, and, and and thanks for raising. I never really thought of that before. No one has mentioned that in the discussion so far. So that that's quite a powerful point. I need to acknowledge that because again, going back to the original thesis that the pandemic has created nothing new. There has been a sh a, a movement away from. There's been an, an, an anti-globalization backlash for a while. You know, we have Trump, we have Brexit, we have Duterte, we have what's going on in Australia. Everywhere. Yes world and then we've seen like an acceleration of not of economic nationalism to the extent that you know japan has this huge fund to incentivize yeah. companies to bring stuff onshore europeans are doing similar stuff and but you, the point you're raising that this really that's a, a supply chain store around goods but with services services are heading in the opposite direction because the internet yeah. is making you know the exchange of services more readily available especially to the extent that social distancing has become the new normal so That's my right. clients that previously insisted <laughs> on seeing me in person otherwise they don't want to do business now zoom is fine and so that 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 is creating new opportunities but so that that seems to be almost like a, a conflict uh, a, a contradiction in terms the way services are heading in one direction goods are heading in another do you see that continuing or do you see some sort of equilibrium arising i, I don't see an equilibrium arising between goods and services i think i think we had gone a bit too it's like a course correction on the issue of goods 
right. right? It's to me, it's like a course correction on the issue of goods. We really were very hyper globalized with people not with countries and policymakers in countries not really focusing on how do we do this in a way that we are also building um, local resilience. So I, I do think that this idea of local resilience is here to stay, right? On the issue of goods. However, even on the issue of goods, I think we are going to see an equilibrium on goods. So it's not going to be every country for itself. Right. They're still going to be, the companies are going to say, well, you know what? Once we have fair and equitable trading agreements that have been agreed between countries, we will continue to see the trade going. But we will need to create what, one of the things we are promoting, and we're going to share a lot more about it over the next few months, is crisis procurement provisions, right? Um, to facilitate trade, transnational cooperation in trade, right? And so if we were to include those kinds of provisions in trade agreements, then, you know, we, we will see not the aggressive nationalist, you know, retreat, um, but you will see, yes, we need to build local resilience, but a balance. Yeah, but some of these things we can get so much cheaper this way. We are going to see how we can create a more diverse and complex supply chain that's not just far but it's mixed, so that's good. I think services, I think your point at the beginning was, I, I think was so on point when you said it really hasn't exposed anything new. Mm -hmm. Services, it's the same thing. Services were, digital services were on the uptake for, you know, for the last you know, decade, mm -hmm. as we know, you know? I, and what COVID has done is whoo, made an exponential rise in that. Yes, I'm a Trini, you know how I respond to things. Right? <laughs> Exponential rise, you know. I don't know. Have you in, in, in um, interviewed any trainee people on your show yet? We have, yeah. Uh -huh, okay, okay. All right, but okay. Sorry, I just like I'm a trainee. Anyway, so um, you've seen that exponential rise in services uh, because of COVID, but it was it was that trend was already happening. Mm -hmm. That I don't think is going to shift. I, I think that is just continuing this way. The you know people who have been having digital business, building digital businesses, have been doing very well, have been seeing more and more opportunities. Um, companies who haven't are now investing in, you know, developing their services in that way. Mm, I, I, for me, and this is, I would say it's evidence-based in the sense that, um, look at what has happened in the context of COVID, look at what was happening prior to COVID. Um, yeah, I think that trend is, is definitely going to continue. Um, mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and so uh, organizations like yourself that support um, businesses working transnationally and doing their taxes, I mean, there's going to be huge opportunities, I think, um, for you to support um, businesses in this area and how do they organize themselves so that they are really doing the best with the value that they're able to create and capture. You know? Fantastic. And one final question. I've spoken to some people whose perspective is a bit, I guess, towards the, I wouldn't say negative, but they are concerned. When, when we look at the tension arising between major powers right now, they, we recall that history tells us that the last time something like this happened, we kind of like had a second world war, right? So it didn't end too well. So countries tend to posture, politicians say things maybe they shouldn't have said. And then eventually there's an escalation and everyone wants to save face and whatever happens, happens until people, comma heads prevail at the end of a certain process. Do you, what is your view? Do you see it heading towards uh, an escalation or do you think eventually cooler heads would prevail and we'd find a new understanding? I think well, that's a big question, big yeah. question. And all I can provide on it is an opinion, and, uh, and that's all it would ever be, right? Because we are, yes, history teaches us a lot, and, uh, but I think we are experiencing, some, experiencing something historically that we have not experienced before because of the new uh, uh, world that we have based on technology, the internet, and the hyper-connectivity that exists in all past crises um, that catalyze certain things, we didn't have the internet in the way that we have now. Mm -hmm. Now that could actually make the situation far worse <laughs> because it can explode 
uh, the impact of, of, of what would happen previously. What I would say is this, and this is just my opinion and it's the reason that's for the work that I do. Um, yes, we see political powers standing off against each other right now, um, and it's very, very troubling, and it is a very, very consuming. I think uh, from the legal perspective, a lot of us thinking around this the space, we think, one, there needs to be a massive shift toward developing more effective global governance mechanisms, right? And so we have the UN and NATO and all these organizations that should be more effective than they are, but because of the way law is created, which is bottom up at, at national levels, there's this gap between mm -hmm. global regulation to, 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 to stop, uh, you know, competitive and aggressive acts of nations that will impact the collective. So we're supposed to have this, we don't have it. So the reason that from my work is this. Mm -hmm. It is troubling, I agree, it is troubling. It is very, very, it is actually the most important thing that we have to figure out, is that we as human beings, now in 2020 and going forward, with the internet that we have, which allows us to spread ideas, to communicate and collaborate with, pe collaborate with people across jurisdictions and all of that. Every single human being that has the passion and the expertise in any area mm -hmm. should be looking to become part of communities, of action-oriented communities that are going to take action in their local jurisdiction to support a collective agenda. Right. And so one way is for us to get global governance right, this big idea of global governance and work and try to get the UN um, doing that right and, and having more teeth and waiting for politicians to to give the UN that support. Because, you know, the UN governance structure is based on nation states voting. So if our problem is with nation states leadership and they're resiling. Look at look at Trump, what he did with the Paris Declaration. Look at what Trump what did with WHO during um, COVID-19. Um, companies pulling away from these international agreements with impunity. If we know that that's the issue that we're dealing with here, then we need to find another approach to deal with this issue. And that is we need to create action-oriented community action that uh, pulls power from political leadership to the people on the ground and so yeah we have to start finding new ways to organize ourselves and i think the internet gives us the opportunity that we never had before for a people driven movement for change and what it requires is that we are not lacking in we, we, we are not lacking in vigilance you know um and that's it it's, it's i think we need more and more of us darren you see, you see what you've done here by saying, you know, new normal, we need to figure this out. And I want to have conversations with people so that I could even understand my trajectory going forward. This is what we want. I think every citizen should be thinking who has the capacity. You recognize the ability that we are able, you and I are able to do these kinds of things is a privilege, quite mm -hmm. frankly. Every professional and all of that, you know, yeah, it's a privilege. We need to understand it's a privilege because there are people right now because of COVID that you know, are deeply suffering Absolutely. all over the world, yeah. right? And so yeah. those of us who have and understand and experience the privilege that we have right now, I think we have a responsibility. That is if we are serious about, you know, if, if we, we have that value system that what happens to my brother happens to me. If you have that solidarity uh, mm -hmm. value inside of you that all of us, cannot be free one of us can be honest so you know the you know the you know the, yeah. the, the the cliche i'm always bad at not cliches and quotes really yeah. bad at those things if you understand the concept if we are, are thinking about our fellow man and those of us who have privilege if we can begin to show up a little more than we have in the past look beyond our personal interests um, and say, you know what, what can I do to advance the collective agenda? Then I think the Trumps and the Bolsonaros and those kinds of people in the world will have less and less power because the more we show up, 
and take power and power comes with you know sharing and accessing information and then taking action organizing ourselves in communities and taking action once we do that then those systems that exist that give power to our political leaders it will it's it's slow i'm not saying it's immediate mm -hmm. but it, it is a trajectory toward change in society and how we, we can change power structure in society. There's sometimes we can do it rapidly. Um, uh, you know, where, where the issue is pressing enough and there's been protest action and people are out there protesting and, and governments are then forced to listen to the people and do all of that. You know, that's, that's one way. I don't, I think that's one way and it's an important way. I mean, I mean, say that but there's also a less um uh sometimes perceived as violent way um you know understanding how systems work understanding how power is distributed in systems and trying to find your intervention point to create more power for yourself your organization your community um i think those of us who have the privilege and time to think about it that's what we need to do and that's what is going to stem the tide of the troubling issues you see um, you know, with some of the leadership that we're seeing in the world today. We just need to rise up more. We need to rise up more. Margaret, thank you for your time. We appreciate you sharing your, your incredible insights. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, Darren. Bye.